Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I am Stephen Philip Katz, a practicing marriage and family therapist in Honolulu. Every two weeks, I chat with other professionals whose lives are dedicated to helping others. Today, it is my delight to welcome back Dr. Sarah Sarkis. We are going to explore the goals of therapy and ask the question, is happiness just another cage? Welcome back, Dr. Sarkis. Thanks for having me. So Good to be back. What do you mean by that? Well, um, what I mean is that when we ask our patients questions like, how are you? Uh -huh. We compel them to put themselves into a I'm on a fine. continuum, I'm fine, or I'm not fine, right. or I'm good. I'm an eight. Exactly, and it it um, it sort of artificially forces the person to put themselves on a scale of good or bad, and so whatever you answer, it just becomes a cage. And there's this expression that good is just another cage, uh -huh. meaning then you have to maintain good, because if you're uh -huh. not good. Uh, then you're bad. So that so is what I meant by that. Is it better to ask, uh, how are you feeling today? Sure. And I don't necessarily, there's probably really skilled therapists that open with, how are you? Right. Um, so, you know, everybody's got their own jive that they have to come right. to, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but for, for my particular style, uh -huh. it's been more beneficial to ask a question that allows them to ponder that we're all of it. We're good, we're not great, we we're, we're, have areas where we're really confident, we have areas where we feel really insecure, and that that's not pathologic. Right. That's the human condition. To feel all these things. Yes, and I think that part of our role as humans, just trying to figure it out, but in our profession as therapists, is to um, convey to our patients that emotional dexterity, the ability to sort of fluidly move through different emotional states without necessarily judging whether or not it's good or bad, you know, kind of eases the human condition, because then you're not like, Oh, I feel sad. I'm depressed. Now, there is real, as you know, there's real clinical depression. But in my opinion, a lot of it is just sort of jargon that people pick up. Like, oh, why are you here to see me today? Because I'm depressed. And then when they really start elaborating what's going on, it's like, well, dad just died and boyfriend broke up with them and the dog ran away. And you're like, oh, you're not depressed. You're having congruent reactions to difficult situations in life. You feel sad. That's a very normal emotion. So isn't that just another word for depressed? Sad? No. To me, depression is like a syndrome. Uh -huh. Sad. You mean like the grief. DSM-5? Yeah, kind of thing. exactly. It's a, it's a exactly. Exactly. Pathology. It's a pathology. Right. We want to be in their interior world of emotions uh -huh. and then determine whether or not it seems um, I'm even reluctant to use the word pathologic, but to, it's our job to, in that assessment period, to sort of figure out, is this more than just grieving? You mean situational stuff? Yes, exactly. The, situ the, the trait qualities versus state. Right. And so some of it is normalizing what people experience. So if, if I come in and I say, you know, Suddenly, I just find my I just find tears rolling down my eyes, mm -hmm. and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean I'm sad? Well, we would have to explore that. We would have to find out what, the t where the tears are generated from, and that would really be the starting point with which you could try to engage the person around their interior world. So the goal isn't necessarily to cheer somebody up. No. Not, right. not necessarily. <laughs> right. I sounded like the Grim Reaper. But no, I mean... No, but that's what you're talking about, emotionally, dexterity. Yes. And also what you talked about 
in other writing that you did about being able to be uncomfortable. Yes. Yes. You have to... I think there's a part of the human condition that mm. requires us to tolerate sitting in, in uncomfortable interpersonal dynamics and intrapersonal dynamics. So that is one of, I think, one of the goals we can, we can model in the interpersonal dynamic with a patient and that we can also carve the space out within the therapeutic room. So in the therapeutic relationship, would it be appropriate for me as therapist to say, you know, I'm feeling really sad. Something you said is making me feel really sad. Would that be appropriate? Well, I don't know if I would can say whether or not I think it would be appropriate because it would be dependent on so many different Situation, things, right, including yeah. the relationship. But right. I would say this, that I think any time we can genuinely reflect the empathic experience we're having of the patient, mm. I think there's healing value in that. Yeah. Because humans that feel connected, mm -hmm. genuinely connected, don't suffer as much. And we know that from the research with geriatric patients and how, you know, when a spouse of like 50 years dies, often the other spouse dies fairly quickly after right. that. Or, you know, now we know through like the, the um, research with like therapeutic animals right. and sense of community right. that we're a, we're a mammal that thrives with connection. Right. It's the only way we survive. So if you can make empathic statements that are accurate, your patient is going to feel connected. They might not feel better, but if we can, I think that part of what we do is we bear witness. So you're not fixing their problems. They're not broken. They're right. just going through life, but you bear witness. You share the emotional experience, and that in and of itself is um, healing. healing. Yeah, paradoxically, if somebody just feels heard, yes. you know, so many times I feel like I'm not doing anything, or I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll repeat back, I'll parrot back what the client said. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you say is you're feeling a lot of pain and they'll go, yes, yes. that's it. Yes. Like, like I'm a psychic. Yeah. Like they just said to me, I'm in a lot of pain. Yeah. And I say, you're in a lot of pain. How did you know? Yeah, because I listened. <laughs> and we're, we, we really are sort of in the business of listening in a unique way that doesn't happen in the regular world. Right. You know, kind of through no fault of the regular world. It just well, is the way like, it is. Well, like, you know, if you're my spouse and you come home and you say, you know, I had a terrible day, my boss told me I'm a jerk, then, you know, the wrong move for me to make would be, well, just tell her she's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Trying to fix it. Yes. Right? Especially so, as a male which gets into the gender patterns of yeah. how our brain works. It's just Somebody neurology. Somebody told me that's called mansplaining. Oh, my God. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys want to uh -huh. fix things. Yes, it's a yeah. Stereotype, yeah, right? it's tinkering. Right. Like on the car. See, I know that I can't do that on the car. Yeah. So I, don't, I think, you know. You've saved yourself a lot of hardship. Same, yeah, I just say, wow, <laughs> that, that's, that must feel terrible. <laughs> Yeah. And then they go, don't give me that therapy crap at home. Yeah. Oh, I hear that all the time. Don't analyze. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So but, so, but why is it different? Like, if I'm sitting on a tack, or is that there's that funny routine I saw somewhere where somebody has, like, a nail in their head, and they're talking to, you know, their, their husband, and the husband keeps trying to tell her she's got a nail in her head. Don't try to fix it. Just listen to me. She's like, no, literally. <laughs> You have a nail in your head. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I mean, well, I'm thinking, the, yeah, why is it different, right? Like, if because I'm you're sitting, not married to the person, which is, by the way, like... No, but if you were the therapist, you would still tell the person they got a nail in their head. Yes. Right? And yes. alleviate the pain, take the nail out. 
I wish it was like that emotionally, like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. Oh, wow, I got a leg cramp. Oh, well, walk around a little bit. Mm -hmm. It'll go away. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel terribly sad. Oh, do this. Well, there are tactical things you can do. Yeah. So you're still male. You really just want to fix it. No. Um, but there are tactical things. No, I'm things. just curious yes. why it doesn't work the same way. Yes, because it's emotions. And they're very different. You know, when we, I guess when we rose above instinct, you know, we you like think we rose above instinct. Only <laughs> moderately, yeah. but you know, we're one notch up. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I mean, it is different. Yeah. But I do think speaking to that urge, because we are people who like to help. You know, we want to be helpful. Um, I've been trying to liberate myself from that for years. But they. Oh yeah, last time we said we were going to go into why did you choose this profession? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so the. There are those tactical things you can do when uh -huh. somebody's in acute pain, right? right. We offer sort of suggestions uh -huh. and takeaways. And to me, that's like, that's our equivalent of saying like, well, yeah, you got a nail in your forehead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, we were talking before about the, what I call the typical dynamic of the woman who is very passionate mm -hmm. and the guy who's totally out of touch with his feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's a very common um, combination that I yes. run into doing and couples, couples counseling, right? Yeah. And it's so hard for both of them, right? Because the guy just wants to run away if it's the guy. Yeah. Right? It's not always that way. Yeah. Right? We can speak in generalities. Okay. Liberate. And and the the more passionate one, the yes. more, it's like why can't you just like be here with me? Talk to me. Yes. Well, how do you feel? How do you feel? That's we're always asking. How do you feel? Yeah. How do you feel? How do you feel? And the guy's like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do with that? Well, it would depend on the particular man, and as you understood why he sort of disintegrated from himself. Because the, beyond the generalities that our society does sort of tend to ask men, boys, at an earlier age to, you know, separate their right, feelings right. out. Um, but each person has their own little interior narrative, right? right? And once you understood that, you, as the therapist, you could connect to that. And you could draw the man's awareness to that, whatever it, you know, whatever it was, um, what series of things that were unique to his environment. You and mean like in his childhood? Dynamics growing up, childhood, loss, grief, whatever it was, right? And um, with that, is in, that's insight, is when you start to understand that your past contributes significantly to who you are now. And so you, you draw awareness to that, and then each time it happens, oh, there's that thing again mm. that happens for you. And, and slowly, my experience has been, like as a human mm. and a therapist, um, that people reconnect with themselves. He'll you mean find get his in touch way. with his feelings? Yes, whatever his expression is. It's not to make him look more like her. Right. right. But make him look more like him. We'll come right back. We have to take a break. Uh, we'll be back with Dr. Sarah Sarkis. Don't go away. Aloha, Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow, eat yeah. the rainbow, and if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha, this is Kili'i Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha.
Welcome back. I'm still Steve Katz, and this is still Dr. Sarah Sarkis. And you just asked me an interesting question. We were talking about couples. Yes. One of my favorite subjects. And you said, how do you sustain connection for a long time? Yes. Right, which is, you know, the, uh, oh, it's the cliche, the empty nesters. Yes. And now they got to look at each other. Yes. And it's like panic. <laughs> uh -huh. It's like, who are you? Who are you? What have I done? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It happens. Where do you start? Frequently. With that couple? Yeah. Um, well, it would depend on what stories they, you know, came in with because they have this... Well, I like to go golfing and she wants to go to see chick flicks. And, you know, if I ask, if I, we want to go on a date, and then she's got to tell me, like, which way to get there and how I made a wrong turn and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we never even get to the movies. We get mad, we get into a fight, we go home. Yeah, that's just noise to keep them from having to actually connect, right? It's like, you just sort of sit with it and wade through it. And some relationships are not salvageable. By right. the way, some relationships, sometimes you uncover that what had unified them was the kids. For good or ill, they stayed together for the kids. Um, so, you know, I don't go in with any, first of all, I should say, couples is not like my complete jive. I right. see them, I work with them, I enjoy yeah. them, but you really live in that world. No, but, but you're right, I don't have an agenda either. Yeah, you I, go in... It's not in, up to me to decide if they should stay together or break up. Exactly. Yeah. So you go in just sort of ready to explore. Yeah. And, um, you know, I would think in those first few weeks you ask a lot of questions like, to the, her, you'd say, what did you hear him say? What did, you know. Right, because they don't hear each other. Because you're literally trying to understand how their brain works. Yeah. How do they process each other verbally, physically? How are they interpreting the other person's sort oh, of intent? Oh, and it's so hard because yes. they're busy making up an answer. They're not listening. Yes. Right, and just yes. you play that game where they have to repeat what the other person said and they can't do it. They can't do it. Or they, they do it. Like, I love when patients say to me, they'll be like, um, I thought about something that you said this week. I'm like, oh, what did I say? Because I'm always so interested to see... What they heard. In the game of telephone, what did they hear that I said? Um, so, and you get the full spectrum of answers, which is, reveals so much data. And that's all we, I always say to patients, we're just collecting data. Mm. So we're just, these are just data points, and we're going to plot it and, you know, or I use the metaphor of like a puzzle. You know, it's like we're going to turn all the pieces over, then we're going to build the borders, and then we're going to start really figuring out the interior. But um, all of it's just data, because you get to be like, oh, that's how she processes information. Mm. Hmm. Or you realize, oh, OK, so she processed that piece of information fairly well. It's funny, when you first said that, when you said uh, something you said I thought about something you said last week, right? At first, I thought you were uh, playing the wife, oh. saying to the husband, and like as the husband, I was getting defensive. Yes. <laughs> oh no, here we go. Yeah, like bring it on. <laughs> Either bring it on or where's the door? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Where's my escape hatch? Yeah, yeah. And the escape hatch for a lot of men is what we were talking about earlier, is that there's a, there's a strong capacity to um, press pause on your emotional experience of something while it's happening. And in a certain environment, like a hunter, that is a, a, an incredible gift. And there's, right. there's other environments professionally and all kinds of environments where the capacity to feel your emotions second mm -hmm but be absorbing things at a very practical level first, really served men so well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, like, it's like most um, emotional traits. It's a coin. And so on one side of the coin, it's a superpower. And if you flip that same coin over, it's your greatest liability. Mm -hmm. And everybody has these traits. And one of the goals of therapy, I always say, is to give people give us, a little bit more leverage over which side of the coin is face up. Mm -hmm. The superpower or the vulnerability. Uh -huh. To choose. To choose. To be aware of when it is happening and sort of mitigate. So why do you go choose? You don't well, think it's really you know, a choice? 
I think it becomes possible for it to be a choice, but uh -huh. that takes a long process that isn't just cognitive. Right. It's a it's an interior experience first. Right. And then we gain the capacity to sort of make the choice like, oh yeah, I'm doing that again. There I am doing I just pressed the emotional pause button. Mm -hmm. Let me try to let me try to tap back in. Or like you said before, I think you said this off the air, sure. that with some people you want to try to regulate yes, the emotional modulation. Words. You want to be able to pause. Like, some like the woman can't. with the passion. Right. And passion's a really good word to use because it's a perfect example of how passion can be something that's really um, captivating and draws you in. Right. But if you if the if the environment is right and you flip that same coin over, it can become unpredictable. Right. And so with with somebody that's trying to modulate or regulate passion they would have the opposite process than the person that's trying to learn how to stay present. Right. More, stay to emotionally stay present. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. And two people often are drawn together who are the opposite ends of the spectrum because it's, it's when it's good, it's like, oh, this person is so well grounded. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not going to go crazy. And then crazy he bores you to death later. You flip the yeah. same coin over, and you're right. like, he's or, a bore. Or he's a bore, or he's dishonest. He's emotionally dishonest. Yeah. He's he's he can't take, get in touch with his feelings. Yes, yes. I have a whole blog on this this part of um, connection and sort of how we're drawn to chemistry. Uh -huh. um, it's on my blog, but it's, I look at it through the lens of like looking at this, this scene in Star Wars that I love, but it's this exact premise that like in the early days of lust at right. this unconscious level, we're drawn to people right. and we don't really know why, but it's yeah. like, it's intoxicating. Well, oh, it's a rush. And then years north of the lust, uh -huh. the coin flips over and you start to see the, the unconscious subtext of why we were drawn to certain people like the guy that you dated at, or the woman that you dated and you just thought she was just so fun and she was like laid back and she loved to have a good time and then decades later you realize oh she was an alcoholic <laughs> and you have an alcoholic parent and you swore you'd never go down that path right that's sort of the very think, quintessential how did this happen exactly and this is exactly how because we fit together like sort of lock and key. Right. Um, it's like one of my favorite lines from Rocky, where like Polly proposes to Adrian, and Polly's like, "Whoa, are you like my sister?" And he's like, "I don't know. She's got gaps. I got gaps. Together we fill gaps." And that's uh, that premise of like, we just fit together, and it's you know years in that you're like, "Oh, that was the fine print on the contract, and I didn't read it." Right. And but then the the goal of therapy hopefully will be to understand that and embrace the other person knowing them better knowing them more fully and understanding both sides of the coin yeah I don't know if I would necessarily completely agree with that that's the goal of therapy it might be the goal of the couple but for me as the therapist the goal is to create a space where each person can sort of over time be their most authentic self right. and be present. Right. And then you can look at each other as yeah. the couple uh -huh. and you can decide whether or not this is something you are still um, in love with or that's workable. And so I just try to, for my own space, because good is just another cage. So sometimes couples staying together is just another it's just them enduring it. So I try to stay equidistant. Do you from have a judgment about that? What do you mean? If they're, stay, if they're just enduring it. Not if they're both coming to that from a place of empowerment. If they both are like, you know, this works and we're not madly in love, but we, we work well together, we enjoy traveling, whatever the, right. whatever the fine print on it's the... It's good country, enough. If that's what they come to, I don't have to, they don't have to
The world doesn't need to reflect my values. Right. It needs to reflect authentically their values. Yeah. Um, but and it's really hard not letting your values get in the way. It's, it's uh, something where you have to be really mindful. Yeah. And, you know, there are certain things that you can't help but have your opinions in right. a way. Right. Um, but, you know, we do our best to make it about their journey right. and them figuring themselves out. So we touched on a little bit. You said, well, maybe this will just tickle it open today. Uh -huh. I asked you a question about um, the whole beauty question. Uh -huh. And um, I, I said, you know, I meet all these women in, in my practice that, you know, I look at, they're beautiful. You're beautiful, they're beautiful, and they don't think they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is that about? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that is like we would have to have like a five-hour summit. <laughs> we, we, should, we should do that. We, we should. A, we should get a panel of, uh, but we, you should on no, your wait, show wait, wait. get a panel of people, and we, we really should engage more in a dialogue around what, what is happening um, that, A, we'd have to define beauty. Right. And what's happening for women that... They all can. They all point to each other and say, yes, yeah, she's beautiful. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Usually if you go back into their story mm -hmm. and you really start to hear the messages and the modeling that they had... As kids. And their family of origin, their uh -huh. community of origin, uh -huh. um, you're going to have a pretty clear understanding of why that is the way it is. Mm. And on top of... But it's of, rampant. I know, because yeah. I was going to say, on top of that, we live in a, in a global society right. that really does put a currency on beauty. Right. We got to go. Uh, it's been a delight, and as I said, it would be, and a pleasure to uh, have Dr. Sarah Sarkis on the show again. And uh, Thanks for what are you doing, for, like, for the next, you know, every other Tuesday? No, just, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me.